for it. So, um, we finally fixed everything. Uh, have a fun with the talk. Encrypted email from Planet Earth with Harry, Mesquio, Gus, and Rebel. Give them a warm hand of applause. Okay. So the moment you've all been waiting for, the ugliest slide of your entire camp. And the ugly slide is about an ugly reality, which is uh, 25 years after the deployment of OpenPGP on the internet, we don't have virtually any uh, messages encrypted end to end. And this is a massive failure of our community. And this, basically, this talk is going to try to understand how such a large failure happened and what's the sort of different angles about how we can fix it. So I'm going to cover the history of how we got to this somewhat fucked up place. Um, Mesquio is going to cover the technical aspects. Gus Andrews from Simply Secure is going to cover the usability aspects, and Evan Hinshaw Plath will cover the growth aspects. And effectively, you know, we don't want to say that it's been a total failure. Since the Snowden revelations, there are so many great projects. I hope some of you are in the room. You know, of course, everyone actually, the only thing that works today really is Enig Enigma and GPG. But we also have the Leap Encryption Access Project trying to simplify key management. We have MailPile, which is now at a good state of beta. We have Pixelated. We have the Experimental uh, Pond. And of course, the most usable, although post-email, is uh, Signal and Tech Secure. So we have a lot of good end-to-end -end products, but I think the real question we're facing is why wasn't all these messages encrypted end-to-end -end by default? And you know, people sort of say that the internet was broken by design. Actually, it's a sort of artifact of history, right? So if you just look at the dates, um, the fact of the matter is public key crypto sort of rolled out right after and was under research and development when the core protocols of the internet were under development. So you have TCP IP published 1973, public key crypto by Diffie-Hellman in 1976, RSA shortly thereafter, SMTP shortly thereafter, and OpenPGP more than a decade after. And of course, you know, it is possible um, and Vint Cerf, in this quote, sort of leans to this possibility that there were attempts by the NSA and other folks on working on sort of end-to-end -end crypto. Uh, you know, of course, the NSA had something like Diffie-Hellman before Diffie put it in public, be, uh, before the internet sort of hit the public. And that there is, but the fact of the matter is, regardless, what we've had to do is we're basically, we've had to bolt on the crypto after we've already had massive deployment. And a lot of people are trying to do this now post Snowden, but the fact of the matter is we've done it before. As you can see, uh, virtually every major protocol had some form of crypto kind of slapped on, the, on it in a roughshod manner often after uh, it was more fully developed in the mid 90s. But the problem, uh, which we're now suffering from, is that designing protocols is hard. And the fact of the matter is, in the mid-90s, we really didn't know how to design protocols very well. Um, the assumptions, of course, that people made around the amount of computational power that would be, be in the hands of average people or government agencies was vastly uh, underrated. Uh, we didn't have any good notions of provable security. We didn't have any notions of state machines when we were building protocols. Um, algorithm agility has been, of course, a mixed bag at best. Um, while we do have, uh, it essentially allows a lot of downgrade attacks, and we have a lot of legacy algorithms, RSA 1.15, whatnot, still in the wild. And right now, the, the standards community is in the process of trying to upgrade all these algorithms. We're trying to get off of RSA into elliptic uh, curve crypto. I'm sure you've all seen Daniel Bernstein's great talk on that. But the fact of the matter is, we still need some algorithm agility because you know, it's 10 to 15, maybe 20 years, 20 years being sort of 
we don't really know what the fuck we're talking about, but ten years being a clear and present danger, we do, of course, have uh, quantum comp com computation coming up, so we have to start getting even thinking about getting post-quantum algorithms into our core protocols. But it doesn't matter uh, what algorithms you put into your core protocols if your actual state machine uh, and your actual ability to prove the security of your protocol is flawed from the beginning. So this is, of course, is the triple handshake attack on TLS client authentication. And you can sort of see it's a sort of miracle that TLS worked as well as it did. But when you really get down to it, when you bolt this crypto on after the protocols are released in the wild, you, of course, will open yourselves by sheer virtue of complexity to all sorts of attacks. And while we, at this point, uh, you know, in the 21st century, understand how to develop cryptographic protocols, what we don't understand, uh, what to do at all, is designing privacy-preserving protocols. So typically, if you look at the older protocol stacks in the internet, we were just sort of throwing identifiers around willy-nilly, and we're seeing more and more breaks in this. And even in new pieces of software, for example, you know, TechSecure has the, probably the best post-email uh, out uh, sort of protocols, we're revealing, for example, people's phone numbers in multi-user chats. And the fact of the matter is all the move towards post-email, the, 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 the thing that all the insecure protocols got right is that they were decentralized, that you could actually run your own. And they were run through a standards body, and we had some core agreement on them. Right now, of course, in the post-email world, where we actually have some chances of getting all the end-to-end security right, uh, decentralization is not being taken account of, so you're basically in end-to-end -end secure silos where you can't communicate with each other. So what I'd like to ask for people to do um, before we go on to the actual sort of hardcore problems, if you're interested in these, we really need you to get involved because the community, to be honest, has sort of fucked this one up. Everyone's producing their own protocols. People aren't cooperating properly. We'll go into this in much more detail, but effectively, there are some places where you can really make a difference and standardize things. Modern crypto is where most of the good post-email discussions are happening. If you're interested in actually getting PGP working, the IETF Open PGP Working Group, chaired by the wonderful DKG, has finally reopened the IETF. The W3C is trying to look at how we could actually make JavaScript not such a nightmare, and the Web Security IG. And of course, um, there's a huge policy debate, and you can sort of say that this is just solutionism, that we're trying to solve mass surveillance by just throwing out protocols which are secure and encrypted and privacy preserving. But, you know, if you want to try to solve the laws on this, good fucking luck. So, next, Mescio. Yeah. Um, can I get. Oh, okay, great. So, let's get back a bit about, uh, to talk about email. Um, as he said, it's been already almost 25 years since PGP was invented. And still, no one uses it. Sure, probably in this room, almost everybody uses it. But we are a tiny minority of the world. And most of the communication of messaging is actually unencrypted. Uh, we, uh, we won the crypto wars. It looks like we already got really far with crypto. But at the end, um, we didn't reach uh, how to make it you. Uh, available to everybody. Many people are saying that there is uh, many problems on, on OpenPGP. I completely agree. Like, we have huge metadata leakage. Uh, we are learning from Snowden that metadata actually matters a lot. Uh, as the NSA says, uh, we kill based on metadata. Uh, so, for example, we have this thing that we call the Wolf Trust that um, to certify keys, we sign the keys of each other, and they leaks a lot on our network of friends or contacts. Uh, we have headers on emails, as, uh, an SMTP that actually put all the emails in clear, all the uh, metadata. Uh, we have many other problems, like forward secrecy. Now it looks like it's really important that we have uh, protocols that preserve your privacy in the future. And it looks like uh, PGP, open PGP is not doing it. Um, we have many problems with key management, like uh, um, people is not understanding how to use uh, keys. And uh, it's actually a hardcore mental problem to understand how this public and private key works and how to sign them. Um, Learning curve, so 
everybody is saying that email is a screw, that uh, we cannot fix it. I do agree, email is a screw, um, but I'm, oops, I'm still concerned how much is actually um, all these problems that I show, uh, problems of open PGP, or not just the implementations that we have right now on email. <clears throat> so I love, I love, oh, sorry for my voice. I love all these projects that are coming out like Pond, Whisper Systems, or yeah, can I have some water? Yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Happens, you're up on our coding with <sighs> the GPT mail client. Yeah. So, sure. I love all these projects that are trying to reinvent uh, messaging. Uh, it's amazing that the people is experimenting with that. We need it. But the reality is that the people right now use email. And uh, if we come out with another um, email solution, we will have another more in the stack, and it's going to be a hard problem to get actually mass adoption of it. So I think we're going to still improve email. Probably we cannot fix it. Um, but uh, there is a lot of effort right now on many projects trying to improve it, and it might be worth it. Um, I want to mention um, some of the problems that I think are there. And um, uh, how I think they can be improved, like key management. Uh, Gus will mention more things on that. I think many, there is many problems on key management that are actually usability problems on the clients. <clears throat> so actually, um, we are used to implement crypto software in a way that we expose the users to all the take, uh, tiny details of the crypto. Uh, so for me, actually, uh, most of the problems that we have with key management in email are actually usability problems. We have some problems of availability that um, all these problems are actually common to all the messaging platforms, I think. And availability to have many devices uh, connected to the same thing. Most of the of all the new protocols are, are having problems to solve the issue. And email also, we have problems. How do we deal with keys to have actually several devices uh, that have them that uh, want to access our email? Or how do we rescue our email if we lose the device? Um, asynchronous communication is a basic thing on, on messaging. And uh, forward secrecy and asynchronous communication have many issues to deal with together. And um, it's a fairly hard problem to solve. Metadata, as Harry just said, um, even Whisper System that is doing amazing things have some issues with that. Um, group communication, like public crypto, is actually meant for one-to-one -one communication. All the crypto protocols that we have are meant for one-to-one. -one. And it's really hard to find a solution to make protocols that actually work well in groups. So it's true that we have many issues uh, that are really hard. Um, I don't think that these issues are specific of email. I think they are general for messaging platforms. And many projects are working on trying to improve that. And there is a really interesting project called Memory Hall that is working on, on hiding headers on emails and signing headers, so basically moving parts of the headers to the body of the emails when you sign them. Uh, there is the URL there. Ooh, I don't think you can see it, but anyway. Um, Google for Memory Hall um, is a process, it's in a process of trying to standardize. And the nice thing of the project is that it's joining uh, the force of many different clients like a mile pile or any mail or leap are working together on this project. There is Conix, uh, Conix is a research project on trying to get um, uh, the authentication of keys uh, done um, 
by certifying keys from providers and by having a, um, a, a proper, very favorable way of checking that the providers are not giving certifications of keys for uh, different, certifi different certifications for different people. Um, and I think this is going to be probably an interesting future on how to simplify the user experience on how to get the right keys for certain people. Okay. Uh, and there is many people implementing a secure email, like uh, Leap, where I work, or uh, MilePile, um, that MilePile um, exposed you to crypto, but they're thinking a lot on how to make, um, make it really easy to use. Uh, Whiteout is also there doing really nice things. They do a plugin for the, bro for the browser and they have interesting protocols on how to synchronize, synchronize keys uh, between multiple devices. And yeah, I think I can pass the voice to Gus that will talk about UX and I will start. Okay. I want to thank you all for coming. I'm becoming increasingly clear there are many things to do at CCC, so it's very exciting to have so many people in the room. Uh, I'm Gus Andrews. I am currently the secure usability, or sorry, a security, uh, secure usability senior fellow at Simply Secure. Um, but I should say, whoop, hello. No, 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 no. How are we doing this? Down or space? There we go. OK, one at a time. That's good. OK. Uh, so I should say I uh, am not speaking for Simply Secure. I wear many hats, one of which is an organizer at Hope, Hackers on Planet Earth, one of which is the producer of a digital literacy show called The Media Show. Um, so here I'm mostly speaking from my experience working with a number of tool developers in this field, um, and that also included my earlier work at OpenITP, the Open Internet Tools Project. Also, I should say, I'm from Southern California, and I tend to talk really fast, so if you see me talking really fast, say, slow down, just give me the little slow down. I will try to do what I can, try to not speed. So I'm assuming that many of you are in the room because you want to help people encrypt. How many people here want to help other people encrypt? Yes, of course. How many people here would actually like to build or work on an encryption tool? Fewer, that's okay, that's good though. It's nice to see some people in the room. Don't. Um, all I, what, I, what I really wanna say here is don't make a brand new tool. Um, one of the things that we have too much of in this space and in open source tools for security is too many tiny, tiny teams with people working one by one. Don't be a cowboy. We don't really need more of that in this space. Find existing projects, uh, hook up with them. Um, also, a bit of a caveat, if you happen to be here, you probably have figured this out by now. If you're here because you want to encrypt your stuff, this is probably not the talk for it. You may want to go find a different talk or a hands-on workshop, uh, just in case there's anybody still hanging out going, what's going on here? Um, I want to say, after sort of talking with a number of tool builders in this field and working with them for a while, uh, it seems like there are a number of trade-offs that developers have to make decisions about. And these impact how usable these tools are. Frequently what we see, and I hate this phrase because I'm a perfectionist, but we see that the, perfect, the perfect ends up being the enemy of the good, right? So uh, you end up striving for perfection and then sort of not ending up with something good. And these are the trade-offs that sort of do that. Um, there are a number of tools in the field that are struggling with whether they should support experts who already know how to encrypt or whether they should support newcomers. I'm not going to call out the names of most of the... Um, most of the tools that I'm talking about here, except if they're doing super awesome things. Uh, this is an interface from a tool which had been saying, we're going to provide an alternative to Dropbox within the next year. And this is the interface they're offering people. They don't actually have, they're not working on a graphic interface beyond this right now. So you'll notice that this actually requires the user to go into a config file, highlight a word, and change it. So that means they need to know what to change it to, and they need to not accidentally paste in the entire contents of like, you know, the book of Kells or whatever they have on their clipboard into this accidentally and screw the entire config file up. That's an awful lot to ask, um, frankly, because uh, users, you know, generally what you want to do is err on the side of not users, letting users make too many mistakes. Uh, and this uh, URL, not only, not only does this uh, config file contain much of what they need to do, uh, but they also demand that the user jump between this config file and a web browser at undefined moments. So a lot of people find this super counterintuitive. Um, so this would be more supportive to experts who want to go in 
and say, oh, you know, I want to change how long my, it is till timeout or how many different servers I'm sharing these files with, the average user isn't going to need that. The better solution here for making it usable for everybody is to hide a lot of the settings deep in a menu someplace. They can still be there. Just don't make this the number one thing that people have to interact with. Um, similarly, along similar lines, we are sort of struggling in this field to uh, strike a balance between educating people and just making it bloody work for a change, right? So there are a number of really great training uh, curricula in this field. Uh, Tactical Tech is here. Go find their uh, security in a box thing. It's great. Um, the EFF has security self-defense. Uh, Level Up has been doing a really great job with um, training us how to train other people. Um, and they uh, are pretty great. Crypto Parties also, uh, I'm a little bit concerned that Crypto Parties are sort of using, you know, I, I don't know that we have a demonstration that they make people, they encourage people to use encryption in an ongoing way. So I'm sort of looking to, to see them, you know, improve their methods, spread their methods to other people. Uh, any of this education is up against the thing that people use on a regular basis. So many, for many people, it's the iPhone. There has one button and you poke it. That's all that happens. In this day and age, we're not, most users are not usually used to going to an entire training course to learn how a piece of technology works. So we're asking people to make a massive trade-off, right? We're asking them to learn a great deal to use these tools, and that, once again, makes it less likely that those tools will be adopted. Um, let me see, yes. Uh, one thing that you, uh, developers can do here is consider using graphics to explain things rather than just doing a whole lot of like writing out text. Um, one of the developers in our field said when I was talking to them at one point, more options is never the answer. Every single word we add to the screen is a new chance to overwhelm and confu confuse the user. That's every single word. We're not talking about every button, but every time you feel like you need to write something out, um, every word can conceivably confuse people. So uh, writing and editing matter, um, and that's not something that necessarily everybody is thinking about. Education also, the more you have to train people, the harder it's going to be for them to adopt things uh, for permanent. Uh, right, so uh, once again, there are certain tools that are er erring on, some tools are erring on this on an easier side than others. CryptoCat, like when I had a journalist come to me the other day saying, help me encrypt my shits. Uh, I took him straight to CryptoCat first just to make sure that we had a secure channel um, that probably nobody would be looking at, and um, so we went there. Um, by contrast, here's another uh, app that shall go unnamed um, that is asking, this is the wizard that every user, I believe, has to go through in order to set up a SIP connection on this, and that is really, really complicated. Um, ideal security versus ease of use. Many of us are planning for attacks that people may not ever, you, like, like James Mickens said, you have a couple, of model, a couple of threat models. Either you're facing Mossad or you're not facing Mossad, right? Like, so, yes, there's some stuff in between, but you're either facing a really, really serious actor or, you know, there's much more simple things you can do to fix things. Uh, one of the programs in our space so it was like, oh, we're really worried about the attack where the, uh, the attacker can look at the phone and see where you press the keys and like look at the where on those. So they scrambled the keyboard. The sheer amount of cognitive work it takes a person just to type in a simple thing like a password, which is already very confusing for them, is significantly harder and it's more likely for them to give up uh, when they see a keyboard that's been scrambled like this. Um, I've also, you know, had people ask me, you know, oh, let's, let's make sure that the users can see the certificates for a VPN. And, um, when I did an interview with a bunch of uh, VPN users and then also people who ran VPNs, even the people who ran VPNs said, I never look at the certificates on my VPN. Like, it's just good to know that they're there, but, um, you know, so a lot of the times users are just not where we are in terms of thinking about how complicated an attack's thing. Once again, putting set settings further down in a menu can help uh, make that easier. Gathering metrics versus protecting privacy is another huge trade-off in our field. Um, my first day working at the Open Internet Tools Project, I was like, okay, let's find out what users are actually doing and where they're having problems, so let's look at some metrics. And I was told, no, you will never have metrics. You may not have them. It is not safe for our users. You'll never protect their privacy that way. Um, but then as I got to know tools more and learned what they were doing, I learned that like ChatSecure um, in the images that you see here, um, you know, if they're in an app store, if they're in the Google app store, if they're in the Apple app store, there is some data being collected. Um, you can see here that I've got the data from Turkey, Ukraine, and Belarus, and I was trying to match this data to um, figure out whether uh, particular events were spurring um, uh, downloading and installing of this. You notice that in Turkey, you're looking at the blue, which is sort of in the background behind the orange, um, it does look like the protests in Turkey actually saw an uptick in the number of people downloading ChatSecure. By contrast, the protests in Ukraine, which is the middle line there, 
no perceivable impact as far as I can tell. There's just been steady growth in use in the Ukraine. Um, and I included Belarus there to say, yeah, they're collecting this data and we actually kind of learned some things. I think it'd be interesting to go in and go, why Turkey? Like, why did Turkey pick up these apps and uh, Ukraine didn't? Um, but you'll also notice that the numbers are so small in Belarus that it is still possible that you could disambiguate and find out who a particular user was. Um, and that might be um, conceivably an issue. But it's, it's worth also talking to users about how they think about these things too. Um, I had some users that I was talking to, I'm trying to remember whether they were journalists or, or activists or who they were, but they said, oh, we thought you were gathering data to find out how the tool was working. So we're actually surprised that you're not doing it. So, um, and then we heard, heard also, um, Second Muse, we'll talk a little bit more about later, did this wonderful project researching with bloggers and journalists in Vietnam who are faced with jail for speaking out against the regime there. And um, the journalist said to them, and the blogger said to them, yeah, we, we give Facebook all of our correct information about who we are and where we are because why wouldn't we? Like, we, aren't we supposed to trust Facebook? Like, we're working with Facebook. They need this from us, right? So talk to users before you make assumptions about what their privacy concerns are. I think we need to ask a little bit more and think about what we could be collecting. And Evan will talk a little bit more about metrics later on. So uh, looking at these tools, what are the things associated with projects that are tools that are more usable? Um, do they have big teams? Not necessarily. Um, I had one team, I was giving them a sort of like, you should be fixing this with your usability, you should be fixing that with your interface. And they said, but we're not Google, you're not being fair. Um, and I said, well, no, actually, I was comparing you to MailPile. Like, MailPile is a team of three people. Shout out to MailPile, I can see you in the room. Um, MailPile is a team of, of three people, um, and their interface looked very new and up-to-date, and I actually had people confuse it with Google. So it was nice and clean and, and simple to use. Um, so it's not about how big your team is, how many people you're working with, but it's where you choose to allocate your efforts. The team that was whining about not being Google had 11 people on their team. They've been around for 10, 11 years, and yet they're still not creating a usable interface because they don't have anybody who's dedicated. They haven't found somebody, they haven't prioritized giving their resources to a person who is actually going to build a better interface. That's what really matters. If you have somebody um, who, is, who has a dedicated UX person, you tend to see a more usable interface. Uh, that said, still having a team of one to two people is not optimal. I had another team say to me, we are only going to have two developers working on this project because um, if we had any more than that, you, you, when, you know, when you add more developers, the number of bugs goes up exponentially, and I'm not sure I buy that um, because their tool is just still not usable, and I think um, they're still having trouble uh, stomping all their bugs. Um, this is sort of the most important thing, and I think Evan's gonna talk about this as well. Good projects, usable projects, observe their users and they listen to their users. They do it early and they do it often. Um, the, what you're seeing here is uh, StoryMaker, which is sort of a tool peripheral to this space, um, has printed out all of their interfaces and they've invited a bunch of potential users in to put a bunch of post-it notes up and go, well, why don't you just put these two on the same screen, or this looks confusing to me, or what if we had a button for this, right? So that's a, one way to begin to get feedback from users, which is you know, pretty low impact. You know? like, people don't necessarily have to say who they are when they're putting these things up there. Um, and you know, there's, there's a lot of, um, it's, it's very easy for people to actually comment on what's actually going on. There's a lot of tools out there, you can ask me for more of them for doing this as well. Um, don't use mailing lists. Oh, I just, I don't even know why. When some developers, when they're saying, yes, we listen to users, they say, oh yeah, we have a mailing list. Uh, you're asking people to constantly be in their mailbox all the time, frequently with also your developers there or your more technical users. You're going to have your um, developer in there who is constantly yammering about how he wants to take this build and make it work on his Raspberry Pi with his custom brew hackety um, you know, version of your software. Don't listen to that guy. That guy is gonna overwhelm your mailing list and drown out all the people who have very quiet, or very quiet concerns that they aren't necessarily even sure that they can speak up about. You know, things that they think are their fault. Um, I was talking with some trainers earlier and we were sort of saying, a lot of the time users think things are their fault so they're not even gonna speak up. And if the discourse is all about like, you know, uh, you know, perfect forward secrecy, people are gonna start to drop out and you're never gonna hear from them. Um, going back to the, to the idea of talking to your users, um, only a quarter of the developers I talk to actually say they talk to users before they start developing their software. How do you know what people actually need? Maybe people don't actually need encryption. Maybe they need more help with their Facebook settings. Maybe they need 
um, some way to protect their mobile device better. Maybe they don't actually need to encrypt their email. You need to listen before you develop a tool. And then also, um, still, once again, only a quarter of developers actually talk to users afterwards, too. So this is something that our open source developers really need to improve on, talking with a number of people. I'll talk more about how to do that in a bit. Uh, other people working on your code base don't count as users. Don't count those. Um, also, don't only hear from people on GitHub, because once again, you're pre-selecting for people who are highly technical, and you're not going to find the real pain points for average users. Um, Thank you, thank you, thank you. Also, yes, I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, uh, another thing we don't see enough of in this field is reliance on st standard patterns. Um, I went looking for this one particular uh, tool that once again will not be named. Um, I'm not sure why this, this is the interface, the image of the background is the interface. I'm not sure so why it's so stretched out and weird looking, but these sort of weird swoopy bits, the fact that it's asked for number or address at the top, this is a SIP client once again. Um, when you ask for number or address, it gets very confusing. And we, I was doing user tests on voice tools last year, um, and a number of these tools were leading, because they also supported regular phone calls, were leading people down calling on a, a POTS line, a plain old telephone number, and those calls would be insecure. But because people, you give people a, a phone keyboard, they're gonna click those and then they're gonna make an insecure call. So people are inter introducing things into their interfaces that are actually causing people to be insecure. Um, don't roll your own interface. There are um, patterns out there from uh, OS X, from Android, from you know probably from Google as well that will say you know when you're designing, please do this, use these colors, give this much space to such and such a thing. Those are free. You don't have to pay for them. Go out and find them. Um, there's one URL from there, and I think I've got more in the links for this uh, talk as well. Um, the other thing about this interface that I was, oh, you can't quite see it there. You can see it on that, on that one. Uh, there's a weird little orange button at the bottom. What do you think that button does? Anybody? Yes. Pulls up the keyboard, right? I don't think it did. It did something else entirely. It was this weird little orange basketball button, and it did a count, totally counterintuitive thing. What you're looking for when you're using a, a standard design pattern is for somebody else to have made all the mistakes for you first. Right? And then go and find out what they've already learned about um, how to not make interface mistakes. There's a lot of knowledge out there about interfaces. OK, what else should you do in order to help people um, get encrypted? So what you should do is you should build a new tool and roll your own encryption. Have we learned nothing? OK, no, don't do that. No, because you wouldn't, you wouldn't build a left. What? Yes, I know. Sorry. You wouldn't. I'm just getting riled up. That's all. Um, you wouldn't put this shit in a computer in a pizza box. So don't, don't build your own. Don't build your own. Go out and find people. First of all, other people who are developing tools, don't be a cowboy. Go find um, your own. Uh, go find other people. Then go find users to speak to who are not like you. Observe them. Um, I'll be talking a little bit more in a second about why observe um, is more important than ask questions. Um, but listen to them and don't interrupt. Um, the key thing is to look for places where users get confused and or stop. And especially if you're the developer, the tool, the instinct is to go, oh, no, 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 no. What you should actually do is don't do that. Um, I have put Meskio on the spot. I've I looped him in on um, user tests uh, for uh, Bitmask earlier, and he was utterly stoic about this. It was, it was great. Um, we put him on a video conference so he could see what the user was doing on the desktop, and I muted him so he couldn't actually speak up and go, oh, no, no. And so he had to suffer through the users going, I just can't make this work. I can't. And it hurts and it sucks, but get used to it. It's just the way that this is going to go. Um, right. Uh, when I say observe people, don't use focus groups. Um, focus groups are probably the reason if you think the soft sciences are soft and creepy and squishy and weird, and it's just people's opinions and a bunch of stories, that's because you've probably have thought about, like you've heard from people using focus groups. And focus groups have um, a very deep bias towards people responding to other people in the room and doing what they think should, they should be doing or saying what they think they should be saying. Um, so that's one tool to avoid. In general, um, what you learn when you do uh, social science research is that self-report data is unreliable. When you're just asking people what they do, they will tell you what they think you want to hear. Um, it is better whenever you can to observe them actually doing a thing. And you find so many wonderful, amazing mistakes. And you just ask people, why did you do that? And then they can clarify you know, their understanding. Uh, for more about why you should use certain methods, I did a talk at Hope last year. I'm sorry, not 2014. Yes, last year was 2014. Time goes quickly. OK. Um, right. But where, though? Where do I find these people I should talk to? 
Librarians are your privacy allies in the United States in particular. Um, they are obligated to help protect their users from, um, you know, government's uh, mandates to go in and look at people's records. So um, they are interested in the things that we're interested in. Also, they work with um, their digital skills teachers. They work with populations of people who are interested in learning more about computers but know th don't know that much. Non-governmental organizations, absolutely. Uh, human rights organizations, LGBT organizations, absolutely go talk with them. They have people who want to learn about these things too, and you, it's, they have easy cases to explain to them why. Formerly incarcerated people as well, people on welfare. Coffee houses. Uh, I know the Whisper Systems team just goes out to coffee houses and asks people, um, and that is a very brave thing. Ten minutes. Oh gosh, I'm super, super running late. Journalists also totally our allies. Um, ask people like if you've already interviewed one person or worked with one person, say to them, "I'm sorry, ah, go back." Oh, now we're totally gone. What happened? It knew I was going. There we go. Okay. Eh. Eh. Okay. Um, don't ask your family and friends. There's this thing called biasing of network effects. You're going to end up hearing things. Um, you're not going to hear from as a range of people if you ask your family and friends. Watch what questions you ask. If you ask, ask how often do you encounter blocked websites, what you hear back, what you're expecting is that people know that things are being blocked, right? So don't do that. Um, ask, do you think you're being blocked? Don't ask, do you encrypt? People may not know what that means. Ask, how do you protect your privacy? Um, don't ask, how do you face censorship? If you're talking to people in China, especially I had somebody uh, get up and walk across the room without even talking to me anymore. Um, yeah, he couldn't even be seen with somebody who was talking about censorship. So yeah, that's pro tip. Don't talk to people in China about censorship. Um, move from general questions to more specific questions. Um, and this will work for you, I promise. This great anecdote that we have from uh, Circumvention Tech Festival in Valencia is that, um, you know, Enig Mail came in, they had only been hearing from people on their mailing list. Look at that mailing list and how dense the amount of information is that they need you, the user to read and that they have, you, you have to give to people. Um, and he came in and he was talking with a number of people who train journalists and activists. And the people were coming up to him and saying, thank you so much, you've saved my friends, you've saved my family, um, your, your tool is just central to what I'm using. And he came away saying, um, I have learned more in the past five days of talking to people than I have in the past five years on our mailing list. He also said, and people were hugging me, and I felt really bad because they had all these serious problems, and yet I, you know, I'm just this guy who codes things. And I felt really awkward, he said. And then he's like, but that was really good. I know I should feel really awkward. So it was this total come to Jesus moment. We promise you, if you talk to people, uh, it will be great. Um, we've developed some personas. If you can't go talk to people, these are some um, idealized situations with particular kinds of people, LGBT activists, um, uh, human rights activists, journalists in Vietnam. Uh, check out this particular page. Um, those are open source, free to use. Um, like I said, Second Muse has done some wonderful uh, reviews of what the Tibetan exile community needs and what Vietnam's digital activists need. Uh, check those out as well. To-do list. I'm just going to go this really quick and then I'll let Evan talk. Is that feedback, by the way, that I'm hearing? Whoosh. I think that's something else nearby. Okay. Um, before you build tools, ask people what they need. Don't build anything that they don't need. Test early with people. Test often. You may not have a working prototype to give them, but you can always print out your interface. You can even sketch out an interface and say, where do you think you would go if you were going to, in this interface, if you're going to encrypt your, or make your email safe, right? Um, find other people to work with. If you have an idea for a project, don't work alone. Um, go find designers to work with in particular. Dribble, uh, D-R-I, triple B, L-E, and then also Modern Crypto Project are great places to go find designers who are interested in helping. Take settings, put them in a menu. Um, trainers I hear from say that they want the help for a given app in the document, not on the web. Um, try using graphics to give instructions, that's really helpful. Uh, Evan will talk a little bit more about metrics and um, yeah, uh, and if you can't come, if you can't do user research yourself, come talk to Simply Secure. We actually have a mandate to help um, people who are working on tools in this space, and we'd love to help you out. Evan. So we're now moving to Q&A. No, 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 sorry. 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 Yeah, so uh, that was the next arrow, is that the one? Yeah. Okay, so uh, I want to, in the last five minutes, talk a little bit about why, why open source and free software that we've been writing hasn't been getting mass adoption, in particular, secure communication software, and why people are using startups or corporations' communication software, and why they're not using our stuff. 
And in particular, I want to encourage us to steal ideas and techniques from, from the capitalists and the startup community because they have ways of making software work that, that are needed. Um, these are sort of startup techniques. And, and so some of these techniques may seem sketchy or, and they certainly are different than the way community developed software has been created. But I think they're the reason we're losing because if you have two kinds of software that are being developed and one is just going in and you're, you're, you're thinking about what you should develop and you only have programmers contributing and you build it and you have another kind of software which is concerned a lot with how it gets adopted and used, even if that other software is not so good, they're gonna be really good at getting people to use their stuff. And so we get people using Gmail because it's, it's really good at getting you to use it. Um, and those techniques are things we can use. Um, as, as developers, when we want non-developers to use our software, we need to stop thinking about scratching our own itches. Sort of the, the ultimate free software is, you know, every developer out there, everyone will be a programmer, we'll all just scratch our own itches and we'll build stuff. And it's great for software aimed at other geeks and developers. But for privacy software, for, for encrypted email, encrypted communications, we need, we need a broad spectrum of society using it to provide security for everyone. And so we need to not be just providing tools that a small group of people can use. So we need, we need to build things that, that people will use. We need to build things that people wanna use, build things that people love. And you do that not by having a great vision like Steve Jobs has of, oh, the light bulb appeared over his head, but you use a set of techniques and use a set of experiments. Um, and so I think even though you look at the sort of lean startup customer development, you know, ideas of product market fit, and it sounds very alien to this community, but the idea of launching things quickly, getting feedback, learning and iterating based on use is something that, that needs to be done in this community rather than just saying, oh, well, we know about these hard problems we're gonna go off and spend a bunch of years developing it. You know, Leap is doing really interesting work in terms of development, but they, they wrote down all their hard problems and then they sat in front of their computers for a few years and worked on solving them. Um, and hopefully they built the right things, but they really should have learned uh, whether or not they were going down the right path and everything else before they started writing code, not a couple years later. Um, and the, the startup world, because it's dependent on money and people are, are running out of money, they're very focused on learning qu as quickly as possible. And, and we need to be doing that. You know, there's a, a term called growth hacking, which is uh, basically figuring out how to get people to use your software and how to get them to keep using your software. And the normal hacker community that's building all these tools doesn't think about growth hacking. We launch the software and it will be good and we do some about pages and then people will sign up and use our software because it's great. And that's not the way it works. Or more to the point, if you have one set of tools which are closed source and not secure, but they're really good at getting people to sign up and you have another set of tools which might be great technology, but don't, don't figure out all the tricks to get people to sign up and stay using it, that software will never get adopted. Like it doesn't matter if we solve the secure communications problem, if we can't get people using it, if we can't have them discovering the software, or signing up for the software, using it, promoting it to friends, coming back and using it again. The, the security aspect of it almost doesn't matter if we can't, if we can't grow the, the user base. Um, we need to learn quickly. Um, we need to figure out ways in which when you're developing software, when we're launching this stuff, you learn within hours and not months. You know, uh, when the, the startup world launches software, they don't write the software first. They launch the page that describes the software and then they have the, the sign up button. Dropbox, everyone's talking about the secure alternatives to Dropbox. The first version of Dropbox was a video that was put on YouTube. The software didn't exist. It didn't work. What he did was he put up a video of what he thought the software would be and got tens of thousands of people to sign up for it 
then everyone who signed up for it said, join the beta program. Oh, I'm sorry, the beta program is full. It didn't exist. He got the users, he sold the software first, and then he wrote it. And the secure communications community spends tons of time writing the software and never figures out how to get anyone to use it. So we need to learn how to learn quickly and not learn very slowly. Um, the, the, the game of getting software adopted is how to make it around this loop as quickly as possible. From ideas to building it, to launching a product, to measuring the data, and then learning again. Now, if you take a year to do that cycle, you're gonna lose to someone who is taking a day to do it. So we need to figure out how all of these tools can learn really quickly. Um, we need to be testing everything. We need to be testing every aspect of our software. Every feature you write should be written in such a way that it's an A-B test, that you have a set of data and cohorts so that you know changing the login interface or making all the buttons purple made your software better or worse. Right now, we don't know whether or not everything we launch makes things better or worse. We don't know if we're improving things. We don't know if not releasing a new version, you'd get the same level uptake. You know, Facebook has no idea where they're taking their platform because each engineer just launches little experiments to small percentages of the user. So they don't know where they're gonna do it, they don't know what to improve it, but they, knew they, want, they know they want you to keep you using the site and keep that engagement. And so, as long as they're playing the game of let's do 10 million tests a day to see how to make our software more addictive, and we, outside that space, aren't playing that game, we're not gonna make addictive software that people use as their primary communications medium. And so, as long as we don't play the game of how do we make this software better in everything we do? How do we collect data on its use? Our software will get, will get you know, it might be great software, but it just won't get adopted. And, and making secure email and secure communication protocols, it needs to get adopted. Otherwise, there's no point in doing it. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is uh, something that's very popular within the, the startup community. It's something called uh, pirate metrics. Um, it's a, it's a very simple idea of how you acquire users. Um, um, and it, it has, this is it simplified down, but basically it says for anyone using your software, you need to acquire the user, as in get them to go to your website. You need to activate it, which means get them to, to sign up and create an account or download the software. You need to keep them there. You need to make money on them, because this is a startup world, so they're doing that. We can change that, so you just need to keep people using the software on a real basis. And then you need them to refer other people. And you can track the growth message, message, sort of metrics of programs by this. So every single project that you work on where you want mass adoption, you have to be tracking these numbers. You have to know what percentage of users go on to the next stage and what percentage of people refer to others. Because that's how you get viral growth. And, and we're not gonna get that growth just at you know, hacker meetings where we're signing each other's keys. You know, it's, it's a race that we face. It's a race between different applications. To get secure communications, we need to win that race. And right now, we're, we're not gonna win that race. <laughs> right now, we have all these different projects very bravely and valiantly fighting out there, and we're not learning quickly, we're just sort of going with the flow. And as long as that happens, we won't build better software, and people will still use the insecure alternatives. Um, so if we do this, if we think about it, there's lots of easy wins. There's lots of easy ways to get the software adopted more quickly. We just have to look beyond the normal open source community. So I want to thank you. Thanks a lot. So we have a few minutes. We have a few minutes for Q and A. If you have any questions, uh, please line up in front of the microphones. If you decide to leave early, please do so quietly. Any questions? Hand signs. What if it means? Making their way there. There we go. Ah, over there, the one with the blue shirt. Ah, sorry. <laughs> yep. Hello. 
please. Hi. Um, I have a question actually about usability. Is there going to be anything else going on that you're participating in with the camp um, to, to do more exercises around this and learn about usability? And then secondly, do you have any references around um, um, helping people who want to become more product people um, to learn this? Because it's a whole different like um, skill set than understanding the technology and the encryption and all of that stuff. Yes, totally, absolutely. Um, thank you for asking. Um, I will pitch that I am, well, this is sort of more a one-on-one -on -one thing. I'm actually going to be going around, uh, hopefully, user testing a couple of encrypted email clients. Um, so if you want to come in on that, I can both sort of like show you how I do user testing, and then also uh, you can help me out with the testing. Um, I can show you the rig that I use and things like that. Um, in terms of resources, actually, one of the things, Evan used to work at an organization called NEO, and some of the um, folks at NEO put, uh, produced a book called Lean UX that I'm very fond of. Um, it does a lot of sort of teaching, like sort of giving you the general shape of like how to, um, just how to sort of iterate quickly. I think that's sort of the main thing that's about. Interface-wise. Yeah, um, we, we also released yeah. a book called Talking to Humans. Yeah, um, yes. Both of those books, the Lean UX book and the Talking to Humans books, are about how to do this process for developing software. And I recommend that you, you read them. Yeah. I think there's also a book, what was the one? Um, I recommend if people are interested in getting involved in this, um, Simply Secure has a Slack channel. Um, if you mail me at gus at simplysecure.org, I can get you on there. Um, and we will be talking about things there, and periodically people post resources there as well. We've got some really amazing people in there from IDEO, uh, from Nielsen Norman Group, from like the gold standard groups in um, usability, and so it's just been a great discussion there. Um, we highly recommend you join us there. Right. Thanks. Uh, over to you. So um, this is a race, and um, don't you think that email by itself will lose the race to other forms of communication, and that we should focus? our efforts to improve other forms of communications instead of plain old email? I mean, I can address yeah. that. So I mean, I, I'll try to address that really quickly, which is uh, it is very possible, and part of me really hopes that in five, four years, I come back to the Chaos Computer Camp, and everyone is using end-to-end -end encrypted post email, signal, or whatever. Um, unfortunately, people keep using email. And the reason people keep using email is even though people are slowly being sucked into these silos, you know, Gmail, et cetera, et cetera, which are nonetheless email, there seems to be something about the fact that you do have a baseline of interoperability. Yes. Between, in, I can email you, of course, from Google to Yahoo, et cetera, et cetera, to rise up. And we do not have that interoperability right now in post-email and whatever the fuck comes after email. Yeah. And until we get that, and I work for Standards Body, and we'd love to have you all come to us and sort this out, um, I highly doubt we're going to get post-email. In fact, what we're likely going to get, rather than a decentralized, secure, end-to-end -end email, is we're much more likely to get everyone on a terribly insecure Facebook messenger and pray to God that Moxie and Trevor fix WhatsApp. Yeah. And we'll basically be st stuck in centralized post-email silos. That's the current trajectory. Because these silos are doing the techniques that Gus and Evan are talking about, and we're not. And this is a problem for me, at least. A couple more data points on trends here. One of them is the reason we are kind of stuck with email is business. Like, business still works with email in a lot of ways. And I think that's going to be sort of a big immovable object. Uh, the other large object with a great deal of, of inertia is China, however, and like the country of China, where email is just not a thing. So it'll be interesting to see whether that has an influence, um, whether you know, increasing business and growth in China somehow um, moves us away from email in that way. But do you really want a future where we're all using QQ? I mean, this is terrible. <laughs> it's, it's WeChat. People are using China these days. Okay. Thanks. Um, we got time for two more questions, so over to you. Just, just a quick one. Um, apologies if we missed this at the start, but what's the best way to get in contact with you all? Oh, um, let me actually bring that slide back up. I'm sorry, interfaces, they're just terrible, because I hadn't mentioned. It's not just us, all of technology's broken. So, there we go. 
All right, so that is, uh, yeah, that's Andrew's work. So, so um, hey, you in the right in the red T-shirt? Question? Uh, yeah, <laughs> just a short one. Um, basically, are you developing on any um, open source projects on your own? Uh, developing an open source project of what? Sorry. Didn't I say don't do that? Um, <laughs> basically, basically the, um, you said you uh, should um, talk to users before starting a project. Yes. And I think basically that's uh, missing the um, idea and motivation behind most open source projects. I think most people start it just because it is cool and we want to have it on our own. Yes. So, uh, yeah. My cool project is talking to users for open source tools. Ah. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, could you give our speakers another round of applause? Thank you very much.